Richard Sturban is the legendary bass singer of the Oak Ridge Boys, and prior to joining the Oaks in 1972, Richard sang with various groups, eventually joining J.D. Sumner and the Stamps Quartet, which afforded him the opportunity of a lifetime, the chance to sing with Elvis Presley and singing with him every night on stage, as well as recording with the greatest entertainer in music history. And it was during this time, in the midst of Elvis's heyday, that Richard was offered the position as bass singer for the Oak Ridge Boys, and he had a major decision to make. Remain on the big stage with Elvis, or chase his own dream? Well, 50 years later, with numerous awards and over 41 million albums sold, and becoming a member of the Grand Ole Opry, and being inducted into the Country Music Hall of Fame, I would say was worth chasing his own dream. So ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome one of the most legendary bass singers in the history of music, the one and only Richard Sturban. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Ward. It's my pleasure to be able to talk to you and to all your fine viewers out there. I'm certainly looking forward to it. And wow, how can I follow that introduction? That was pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> you, I think you very well deserve that. And what an incredible career that you have had but what was the spark that made you want to be a singer? It's kind of interesting. You know, I, it's hard to believe, but the first singing that I ever did was as a boy soprano. And that's a fact. I was, uh, I was about six years old and I was in church. I was in Sunday school and I don't remember the song that I sang, but I can still in my mind picture that experience of me in front of the congregation singing. And and I felt impressed that day, believe it or not, only a, a, as a boy of just six years old, that this is what I was meant to do with my life. You know, I, I felt like I was meant to be in front of people and singing. Now, you can probably tell by the way I'm dressed, I'm a big baseball fan. And I, I, I thought about wanting to be a ball player, but I didn't get to a very old point in my life when I realized I did not have the talent to be a ball player. So I pursued my dream, you know, as, as being a singer. I had a high voice, believe it or not, until I got into junior high school. And in seventh grade, I was still singing tenor in what we called the Glee Club back then. Uh, but over the summer, between seventh grade and eighth grade, my voice made a drastic change. And boy, did it change. <laughs> and the choir teacher, when I went back in the eighth, for my eighth grade year, the choir teacher could not believe the difference. She ended up putting me in the second base section. And uh, obviously, I've been there ever since. <laughs> well, were any of your relatives? I mean, did they have the, the, the bassy tone in their voice like you? You know, kind of, but not quite to the extent, you know, that I have. You know, I, I, singing is like anything else. You know, the more you use your voice, the better it becomes. It's like a muscle. And the more you work it, the more you exercise it, it becomes better. So, you know, I, I just followed my dream, you know, when, uh, when, when especially when I made the decision to, uh, to leave Elvis and to, to join the Oak Ridge Boys, I, I was really following my dream. I was following my heart. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people question that decision. How could you leave Elvis? and join the Oak Ridge Boys. But I really believed in my heart I was doing the right thing. And now that I look back 50 years later, I think back then I made a pretty, pretty good decision. You know, I, I never dreamed uh, back then when I was a young man in my 20s, s standing on stage with Elvis, that someday I would not only be in the Gospel Music Hall of Fame with Elvis, but also the Country Music Hall of Fame. You know, if, if you walk into the rotunda, uh, at the Country Music Hall of Fame here in downtown Nashville, you will see the four faces of the Oak Ridge Boys in bronze. And then you look down the wall, you'll see Elvis's face there as well. And not just Elvis, but Johnny Cash and Dolly Parton. You know, the list goes on and on and on for the Oak Ridge Boys to be a part of that family. It's, it's beyond words. It really is. So, like I said, I never dreamed back in those days when I was singing with the biggest star in the world, someday I'd be in the same Hall of Fame with him. But you never know how things are going to happen in your life. Well, that's true. And, you know, I watched Elvis on tour, and I was more interested in the behind the scenes of the singers and the musicians with Elvis. But why did the Stamps have two bass singers? Well, that's kind of interesting. Uh, 
I happen to be in the right place at the right time, and I'll explain that to you. Uh, I was singing in my own group called the Keystones. In fact, Joe Bonzo was in that group as well. Uh, up, up in the Northeast, uh, we were actually living in Buffalo, New York at the time. And I got a phone call from J.D. Sumner, not J.D. himself, but his nephew, Ed Enoch. And he said, J.D. wanted to get off of the road and devote his time to his publishing companies. He had a talent agency, I believe, and businesses on the side. And he wanted to hire a younger bass singer to take his place. So he offered me the job. I took the job. It involved me moving to Nashville, which, you know, and I've been living here for well over 50 years now. But uh, I was singing there with J.D. and the Stamps, like I said, and I was in the right place at the right time because J.D. got a phone call from Elvis. Elvis was looking to hire a new backup group. He had the Imperials working with him, but they had a conflict. They could not do the tour, so he wanted to hire a new backup group, and he offered the job to J.D. and, and the Stamps. And like I said, I was in the right place at the right time. All of a sudden, I found myself on stage with the biggest star in the world. It was mind-boggling. You know, I had some great experiences. Uh, I got to know Elvis just a little bit. It was a special time in my life, you know. And I have to admit, you know, some of my fondest memories uh, with Elvis involved gospel music, believe it or not. You know, even though Elvis was the king of rock and roll, and he certainly was. Uh, I really believe deep down inside, his favorite music was gospel music. And we would spend a lot of time, you know, the Stamps Quartet, singing gospel quartet songs with Elvis. He would want to find, if we were on the road, he'd want to find a piano somewhere where we could get around the piano and sing. And he also loved spirituals. You know, we, I, I, I developed a new appreciation, for, you know, for spirituals, but it was a special time. And so that's one thing that people probably don't realize, even though Elvis was the uh, king of rock and roll, I really believe deep down inside his favorite music was gospel music. Well, wasn't it interesting that Elvis's Grammys actually came from his gospel album and not from any of his rock albums? You know, that's kind of interesting. And if you listen to any of those gospel albums, I think you will understand why. You could tell he really deep down inside believed it. You know, I, 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 I remember, you know, night after night being on stage with him. And it always seemed to me the highlight of his concert was when he sang How Great Thou Art. You can tell when he did it. He felt it deep down inside. And I think that does make a difference. Well, no, you know, when I was watching Elvis on tour and, and I was watching that when he was singing How Great Thou Art, and I'm thinking, wow, you know, back in the day, here's the biggest entertainer in the world, but he's singing about the Lord before the mainstream audience, but everybody loved it. I think we need to go back to that today. You know, in this day and age in which we live, uh, Jesus is not going to hurt us at all. I think the more we can sing about Jesus, I think that's the better better off that we're going to be. And I think, you know, we have a lot of problems in this in this world right now. And the real answer to fixing these problems is getting back to our to our faith, you know, and, and, and our trust in the good Lord above. And 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 that's what we try to do as the Oak Ridge Boys. We try to always remember that when we're on stage singing and singing some songs that they will, will do just that, honor the, you know, the name of Jesus, because I think that's what we need in this day and age. Well, you know, you, y'all recorded your uh, newest release, uh, Front Porch Singing, which is a collection of amazing songs. And I had to go back the other day to listen to the album again, because my favorite song on the whole album is Rock My Soul. And when I was watching Elvis on tour, you and Elvis and, and the rest of the, the singers there uh, gathered around the piano were singing Rock My Soul. And I was like, wow. The song is so timeless, and you guys just bring it back to life. Well, thank you so much. You know, Dave Cobb, you know, he's he's now our producer. He's produced the last four albums on the Oak Ridge Boys. Excuse me. He is one of the hottest names here in Nashville right now. And, uh, you know, he has a way of creating feelings in the studio. And he can take an old song and make it sound like it's up to date, make it sound like it's current. And at the same time, the reverse of that, he can take a brand new song 
and make it sound kind of retro. He's he's got that ability, and that's what he did with the Oak Ridge Boys. You know, I think on on front porch singing, I think we found a great collection of songs, uh, some old songs, old gospel songs that people will recognize that they can sing along to, some old country songs as well that they can sing along to. But Dave Cobb also has a relationship with the young songwriters here in Nashville. They work in the same building with him, RCA Studio A. They have a writer's room up on the top floor. And quite often we'll be down in the studio recording and they're actually writing songs for us on the floor up above us. And that that's the case, you know, with, with this album, you know, as, as well. It, Dave Cobb wanted to record it in a very informal, unstructured kind of a way, just creating the feeling of four guys just gathering on a front porch and singing and harmonizing, you know, in a very informal way. And I think there's one song on the album that I think is a great example of how we, we did that. I remember one morning walking into the recording studio and we had just been there a short time, just barely settled in. And Dave Cobb said, fellas, if you guys were on the bus and you were warming up, getting ready for a show, what song would you sing? He said, it does not have to be one of your hits. It does not have to be something you've recorded before. But just what would you sing to just harmonize together on the bus while you're getting ready to kind of warm up for a show? Immediately, Dwayne started, our lead singer, Dwayne, he started that old spiritual called Swing Down, Sweet Chariot, Stop and Let Me Ride. We had never recorded that song before. We all knew the song. We had, we had sung it many, just bits and pieces of it at time on stage, but never actually recorded it. We immediately joined in Dwayne, harmonizing right there in the studio. Dave Cobb said, that's it. That's it. Get to the microphones right now. And we had just walked through the door of the studio. We weren't planning on doing that. And I don't think we were there an hour. And it was a done deal. You know, the, the, the musicians were not even there yet. We had, the bass player was there. He played bass to kind of keep us together and keep us on pitch. But an hour later, it was a done deal. So I think that's a, kind of a good example right there of how informally we recorded parts of this album. It sounds like Dave Cobb is a genius because as you're telling that story, I'm thinking about he must have very good intuition of bringing out real emotion from you guys that is laid down on vinyl. So as fans like me listen to this album, it's like we're right there with you on the front porch. Well, that's right. He, he's a master at doing that. He he wanted to capture the four, the heart and soul of the Oak Ridge Boys, the four voices. And you can tell the four voices right out there in front, very, very predominantly. You know, in fact, he, he calls us his crazy uncles. <laughs> we, <laughs> we have a great relationship with him. And next year, we, we are ready. It, things are ready in the planning stages, ready in the talking stages of going back into the studio sometime next year, probably in the spring, and doing another project with Dave Cobb. I don't have a, a, a title that I can give you right now. I don't even have a list of songs because it's still in the talking stages, but our record label definitely wants us to go and do another album. Dave Cobb has already agreed to produce it for the Oak Ridge Boys. So we have something to look forward to next year. Another project with Dave Cobb. Well, I love that. And I know that myself and all of the fans out there are going to be super excited and can't wait for that new project to come to life and hit the airwaves. But I want to ask you something, Richard, because, you know, I see when I went again, I, ha I went had to go back to Elvis on tour and watching all of you sing around the piano, singing the gospel songs. But I was very interested in, you know, I, I watched the uh, the concert, you know, everybody is singing on stage and just massive amounts of fans filling up these arenas. But what was Elvis like, not as an entertainer? But what was he like in the recording studio? Was he very hands-on when it came to musical arrangements? For the most part, he was. Elvis was not going to record a song unless he liked the song. I remember being in the recording studio out at the RCA studios out in Los Angeles. And we sat there and we started, we started listening to demos. One demo. See, Elvis never knew what he was going to record until he got to the studio. And we would get there. He started listening to demos. 
he he heard one he didn't like it he pushed it aside pushed it. then finally he heard a song that he liked he said okay let's go let's record this and that, that i think the best example of that i can think of is a song called burning love a hunk a hunk of burning love when the demo of that song came on you could tell elvis's eyes lit up he said yes we got to record this. And, you know, he was going through a period of his time of his career where he hadn't had a hit record in a while. And that kind of that, that song right there kind of brought him back and put him back on the charts again because it's 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 a, a taste of the old Elvis in a lot of ways. And uh, he, he just loved that song. So and, and Elvis also recorded in the studio kind of like he sings on stage. He, he used a handheld microphone and he would walk around the stage. He was an engineer's nightmare, <laughs> but he had a way of doing things and he was going to do it the way he wanted to do it. And he was not going to sing a song 10 times. You had to get it the first or second take or you weren't going to get it from Elvis, you know, but that's the way he did it. He did it in his own way. And I think his track record pretty well speaks for itself. Well, what were what were the rehearsals like if you're getting ready for a concert tour? What were the rehearsals like with Elvis? Well. Sometimes they went very well, sometimes not so well. I, I remember one time in particular, we were rehearsing and it was not going well. And uh, I remember Elvis didn't like it. He said, let's stop it down. And he walked off to the room, he walked off to the side and he came back, pick up, okay, let's try it again now. And uh, it still was not going well. So he, he just threw the microphone down on the floor. I remember that. He went into a room on the side, and I remember, you know, he was in the karate. And you could hear him in the in the room doing karate chops and all this kind of stuff. And so I, that was his way of letting off steam because he was not happy. He came out of there. He said, okay, that's it. We're done for the day. And he, and he stormed off, you know. So, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> if, if, if things did not go well, he would not hesitate to let you know. But for the most part, things went very well, and there was never really a problem with him. Well, when you were offered the the position as bass singer for the Oak Ridge Boys, how difficult was that decision to leave Elvis and then chase your dream? Well, you know, it believe it or not, it was not for me personally not that difficult of a decision. William Lee Golden called me up. He, 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 he placed a phone call to me that really changed my life, you know, and he, he told me that the bass singer in the Oak Ridge Boys, his name was Noel Fox. He was going to leave the group and the Oak Ridge Boys wanted to know if I would be interested in, in taking the job. So here I said, I already mentioned this earlier, you know, I was apparently on top of the world, you know, singing with the king of rock and roll, but I had to make a decision. But to try to answer your question, it was really not that difficult of a decision. I was a big fan of the Oak Ridge Boys. I loved the music that they were making, and I really felt that the Oak Ridge Boys had a great deal of potential, and I wanted to be a part of it. So I made that decision back then in 1972 to leave Elvis and to join the Oak Ridge Boys. And, you know, a lot of people questioned it. You know, how could you do that? But I really believed I was doing As I said earlier, I followed my heart, and here 50 years later, I'm not sorry for one day that I made that decision. You know, we have been so blessed as the, as the four Oak Ridge boys. We've had such a great career. So many good things have happened to us. It, uh, I don't have enough time to explain it all right here. But we had, you know, and, and uh, so, so uh, uh, like I say, we've been blessed. I thank the good Lord above that I've been able to be, spend my last 50 years of my life singing in the Oak Ridge boys. And one thing I think is very important. We do not plan to retire anytime soon. You know, oh. I think we have to. I think we have to be realistic. Nothing lasts forever, including us. But I think the good Lord above will let us know when it's time. And I don't think we are there yet. You know, we still have some songs to sing together, and we're certainly looking forward to that. You know, uh, I think health is the key to our future. As long as the good Lord keeps blessing the four Oak Ridge boys with good health. You're going to see us out here doing this because this is really, really what we love doing. Well, what are, what are some of your fondest memories uh, with the Oak Ridge Boys? Ooh, that, that is a good question. You know, uh, so many great things have happened to us. You know, we, de we developed a friendship 
with President George Bush, George Bush Sr. And I'll, ne- I'll never forget that. Many, Ronald Reagan was the president of the United States. George Bush was the vice president at the time. We were invited to sing on the lawn of the White House for the congressional barbecue. And I remember that day standing there doing a sound check on the stage they had set up on the white the lawn of the White House. And you could tell by looking around, you know, this the beautiful green grass of, uh, you know, on the lawn of the White House, the beautiful buildings, you could tell this was not going to be a normal day. <laughs> and it was not. <laughs> and I remember while we were rehearsing there, doing some songs, we saw this entourage of men walking across the lawn, tall gentleman standing kind of in the middle. He came walking up on stage. And he introduced himself as Vice President George Bush. He did not have to do that. We obviously recognized him immediately. But he proceeded to tell us that he was a big fan of ours. And he said, I cannot be at the concert tonight. He said, so would you guys be willing to maybe do a few songs for me right here, right now? We say, sure, Mr. Vice President, tell me. What would you like to hear? And that's when we realized he was telling us the truth that he was a big fan because he started naming album cuts. He started naming what the kids call today deep cuts, songs that are not singles or not hits. And so we realized then he was really familiar with our music. Right there on the spot, we proceeded to give him a little mini concert right there in the afternoon that day. We established a friendship with him that lasted until he passed away. And we, we, we campaigned for him. Uh, we got to know his wonderful wife, Barbara, very well. Uh, we, we sang, you know, for him many times when he was in the White House. And after he left the White House many times, we would get together and sing for him. We would go every summer to uh, Kenny Bunkport, uh, Maine, where they have their summer home. And we would just hang out with George and Barbara. We would give him many concerts right there in his living room. And of course, he'd, he'd invite the neighbors over. That, 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 he, had, he had to do that, you know. But it, it, it was like a special time. And, you know, every time we sang for President Bush, he always had to hear his favorite song. And believe it or not, that was Amazing Grace. He loved Amazing Grace. And we sang it for him many times. Not too long before he passed away, he asked us, if we were saying Amazing Grace at his funeral. Mm. We said, sure, Mr. President, regardless of wherever we are, we will be there. You can count on us. We had no idea we were going to be doing a Christmas show in Spokane, Washington, of all places. But we did our Christmas show. After the show, we went directly to the airport and got on a private jet that was donated to us by a very dear friend, Flew basically all night to get to Houston, got there early in the morning, went to the hotel, took a quick shower, went to the church. And there we met George W. Bush and Jeb Bush and members of the Bush family. They all thanked us you know, for doing this. And we sang Amazing Grace at President Bush's funeral. It was a very emotional experience, to say the least. you know. And after the funeral, we went back, got on the private jet again, flew back to a place called Kennewick, Washington, where we did a Christmas show there again that night. We did all of that in about a 24-hour period with very little, if any, sleep. We did not miss a date in the process. But the most important thing is we kept our promise to President Bush, and he always taught us to do the right thing, and we felt that was the right thing to do. Wow, what what an honor and what a very deep Friend, long-lasting friendship with uh, President Bush. That is the most incredible story, Richard. And I'm so glad that you and, shared and, and that with us. For, for, for anybody who might think I'm talking about politics, politics has absolutely nothing to do with friendship. We became friends. That was, that was the real key right there. That, <laughs> that's, that's it. Oh, hey, friendship is above all things, regardless what a person's title is. And uh, again, I agree with you. This has nothing to do with politics. It's about friendship. And it's the songs of the Oak Ridge Boys that, to me, not only create memories for life for a lot of people, there's a lot of 
songs that I think even create friendships among the fans. And for you, what is your favorite song of the Oaks that you like seeing? Well, you know, the, the obvious answer to that would probably be Elvira. You know, uh, if I had such a thing as a claim to fame, it would probably be giddy up, um, papa, um, papa, mau, mau. And, you know, even after all these years, 41 years now of doing Elvira every night, it, is, it does not get old. You know, I, I, a lot of fun for me is when we, I get to the giddy up, um, papa, mau, mau part to look out in the audience and see all the men trying to sing along with me. That, 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 that is always a lot of fun. But believe it or not, if I really had to completely answer your question, probably thank God for kids. You know, that's probably the most requested song that the Oak Ridge Boys have had over the years. And William Lee Golden does such a great job of doing that song. He has a great way of, first of all, interpreting that lyric and then communicating that lyric to the audience. And you can tell when he's singing that song, and you're looking at it, you can tell it's touching people. You can tell it's moving people out there. You see people holding hands, people hugging their kids, you know, uh, tears in people's eyes sometimes. But you can tell it's, it's reaching people. So it's, it's, if I had to say a highlight of an Oak Ridge Boy show every, every night has to be William Lee Golden singing Thank God for Kids. Right. You know, Richard, what I love about the Oak Ridge Boys is there's four members, each very distinct from one another, but the fans literally have no favorites. They love all four of you equally. You know, it's not like the Beatles where people would say, oh, I like Paul better than John, but the Oak Ridge Boys, everybody loves all four of you equally. And, uh, and I, I literally cannot wait for another brand new album from you gentlemen, what an incredible career, a legacy that you all have left on the footprint of music history. And I'm just glad that you told us that uh, no plans to retire. I think that just made all the fans happier than ever. You know, as I said, I think we have to be realistic. Nothing lasts forever, including us. You know, but I think as long as the good Lord above, you know, we'll continue to bless the four of us with good health. We're going to keep doing this. I think we he will tell us when it's time, and I think we'll know it. That's it. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, you've got to head over to richardsturban.com. Pick up Brent, his book, Elvis to Elvira. There's only a few copies left. And as for the autographed version, that's for sure. And I understand, Richard, there's going to be an updated version coming out soon, as well with a, this amazing book. And also, ladies and gentlemen, Front Port Singing, the recent release album of the Oak Ridge Boys. There we go at the Oak, at oakridgeboys.com. Check it out. Buy the album. Check out Richard's incredible book. And again, Richard, I want to thank you for your time and for honoring us with your presence on the show today. Ward, thank you. It's been my pleasure talking to you and all your fine listeners. Thank you.